Now 2.3.10. The Buddha said, Monks, these two conditions have part in knowledge. What two? Samatha and Vipassana. Tranquilization and contemplation. If cultivated, what profit does Samatha or tranquilization attain? The mind is cultivated. What profit results from a cultivated mind? All lust is abandoned. Monks, if contemplation, vipassana, is cultivated, what profit does it attain? Insight is cultivated. If insight is cultivated, what profit does it, it, does it attain? All ignorance is abandoned. A mind defiled by lust is not set free, nor can insight defiled by ignorance be cultivated. Indeed, monks, this seizing of lust is the mind's release. This seizing of lust is liberation by mind. This seizing of, of ignorance is liberation by wisdom. That's the end of the sutta. This is one of the suttas which are quite important as far as meditation is concerned. Because here the Buddha is saying that, that two conditions uh, bring us knowledge. Uh, samatha and Vipassana. Uh, the Buddha didn't say one, you know. The Buddha said two conditions uh, result in knowledge, uh, samatha and vipassana. And then the Buddha says that by cultivating samatha, uh, finally the lust is abandoned. And by cultivating vipassana, you get insight. And then finally all ignorance is abandoned. Sometimes people translate this word vipassana as insight. But here you notice uh, that Vipassana, if cultivated, uh, results in insight or wisdom. So, uh, Vipassana cannot be insight uh, or wisdom. Vipassana is something that is practiced, uh, will result in insight or wisdom. Therefore, the proper translation should be contemplation. In Chinese, it is translated as jir guan, jir for samatha, and Kuan contemplation uh, for Vipassana. And then finally the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, the mind defiled by lust is not set free, nor can insight defiled by ignorance be cultivated. In other words, the Buddha is saying uh, that both are necessary, uh, that lust must be abandoned and ignorance must be abandoned. Uh, that's why the Buddha is saying that both Samatha and Vipassana are... Uh, uh, Necessary. Uh, this word uh, samatha, uh, tranquilization, uh, is the work uh, of making the mind tra tranquil. Uh, and there are different levels for different stages of uh, Aryahut. Uh, in two suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, the Buddha says that the Sotapanna and the Sakadagami, first and second stage Arya, uh, they only have perfect sila. Uh, Whereas the Anagami has perfect sila and samadhi. And the Arahan has perfect sila, samadhi and panya. So you can see yeah, that Anagami and Arahan have perfect samadhi, which is always uh, stated in the suttas uh, to be the four jhanas or at least one pointedness of mind. So from here you can see that Sotapanna and Sakadagami uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya uh, does not require jhana. Uh, so from here you can see that Samatha, the practice of tranquilizing the mind, uh, has different levels for Sotapanna, Sakatagami, Anagami and Arahan. Uh, um, Samatha also uh, leads to the uh, lowering of the reduction of the hindrances. Uh, and uh, in the Sangyutta Nikaya and the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says, uh, the condition for seeing things as they really are is samadhi. Uh, so, mm, nowadays, sometimes we have some controversy over the uh, uh, people who practice samatha and pra people who practice vipassana. But sometimes people get confused. Uh, the controversy uh, should not be uh, about whether samatha is better or vipassana is better because both are necessary in the Buddha's teaching. 
uh, the con if there's any controversy, it should be whether the Buddha's teaching uh, is to practice both samatha and vipassana, or is is it only that one is necessary? Just as nowadays some people are saying that only vipassana is necessary, but samatha is not necessary. For this, uh, we see in one sutta in Anguttara Nikaya 4.170 where the Arahan Ananda said in his old age that there are only four ways to Arahanhood. The first way is Samatha first, followed by Vipassana. The second method is Vipassana first, followed by Samatha. The third is Samatha and Vipassana at the same time. And the fourth is that uh, you contemplate on the self, and then you attain one-pointedness of mind, and then the way is made clear, and then... You, you realize the way to Arahanhood. So from this uh, sutta, we find that both Samatha and Vipassana are necessary. La. And there is nowhere uh, in the sutta stated uh, that you can attain Arahanhood uh, without one-pointedness of mind uh, or jhanas, uh, uh, as uh, was taught by the Buddha. La, huh? Now, the other day, I did not explain uh, what you mean by liberation by mind and liberation by insight. These are the two ways uh, a person attains arahanhood. Uh, and it is, uh, if we study the suttas, uh, all the nikayas, uh, then we find uh, that there are three ways in which a person attains arahanhood. One is the person attains uh, the four rupa jhanas and then the four arupa jhanas and then after that uh, cessation of perception and feeling and coming out from perception uh, cessation of perception and feeling uh, then he uh, attains uh, uh, this uh, liberation uh, and the second one is he attains the four jhanas. And coming out of the four jhanas, he contemplates the four noble truths, etc. And he becomes an arahan. The third way a person becomes an arahan, according to the suttas, is when he does not use the jhanas at the moment of liberation. Like the case of the arahan Sariputta. A Sariputta, according to one sutta, was fanning the Buddha. And the Buddha was talking to an external sect ascetic. And because of hearing the Dhamma, as the Buddha explained the Dhamma to the external sect ascetic, Sariputta, just from hearing, he attained uh, Arahanhood. And it is commented by the commentaries that Sariputta was liberated by wisdom. Now, there is one sutta in the Majima Nikaya, where the Buddha said that Sariputta had attained all the jhanas, all the four rupa jhanas, all the four arupa jhanas, plus cessation of perception and feeling, Niroda Samapati. And so, uh, a person who is liberated by wisdom, uh, uh, even though he does not use jhana at the moment of liberation, it does not mean that he does not have jhana. Uh, all arahans have jhana because the Buddha said in two suttas in the Anguttara uh, Nikaya that uh, Sotapanna and uh, Sakadagami, they have perfect sila. Anagami have perfect sila plus samadhi. And arahan has perfect sila, samadhi and wisdom. Uh, sila, samadhi and panya. So, uh, in the suttas, the Perfect samadhi is always defined either as the four jhanas or one-pointedness of mind. So, uh, the difference here between liberation by mind and liberation by uh, insight or wisdom is that liberation by mind uh, is the first two cases where they attain the jhanas and coming out of the jhanas, they contemplate and they become liberated and become arahan. So that is liberation by mind. Whereas liberation by insight is not using the jhanas at the moment of liberation, but uh, but because the mind is very clear due to 
the cultivation of jhana previously, uh, then just from contemplation itself, uh, that person attains arahanthood. Uh, so this is the liberation of uh, by mind and liberation by wisdom. Uh, uh, if you are interested in further details, uh, you, can, you can look it up in my booklet uh, called Samatha and Vipassana, where it's explained more in detail there. Now, the other thing about this sutta I would like to remark is it has to be read uh, in conjunction with another sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 6.29. In that sutta, 6.29, I stated that the best condition for insight uh, is a mind uh, that is so concentrated uh, that it is bright. Uh, a mind that is fully concentrated and is tot- very bright. Uh, and that is the best condition for insight. In other words, uh, it is saying that samatha, the practice of samatha, tranquilization of the mind, uh, uh, will give you insight or wisdom. And the other thing mentioned in that sutta is that uh, to abandon lust, uh, uh, it is uh, very good uh, to practice contemplation on the 32 parts of the body. Uh, this contemplation of the 32 parts of the body is a uh, vipassana practice, contemplation. Uh. So in other words, here it, it is saying uh, in this Sutta 6.29 that practicing of 32 parts of the body contemplation uh, or vipassana leads to the abandonment of lust and the practice of samatha until the mind becomes concentrated and bright uh, is the best condition for insight. Now this is quite the opposite of the sutta I just read just now because just now that sutta says that when you practice samatha, tranquilization, it leads to the abandonment of lust and vipassana <coughs> will uh, bring about insight. Uh, so that is why suttas uh, have to be uh, compared. Uh, if you just read one, you get a one-sided uh, picture. Uh. So basically, uh, what these two suttas also say uh, is that samatha and vipassana are both necessary uh, for knowledge or insight. Now we come to the next sutta, uh, 2.4.1. The Buddha said, monks, I will teach you the condition of the unworthy and that of the worthy. Do you listen to it? Attend closely and I will speak. Yes, Lord, replied these monks to the exalted one. The exalted one said, Monks, the unworthy man is ungrateful, forgetful of benefits. This ingratitude, this forgetfulness is congenial to mean people. It is altogether a feature of unworthy people, this ingratitude and forgetfulness of benefits. But monks, the worthy person is grateful and mindful of benefits done to him. This gratitude, this mindfulness is congenial to the best people. It is altogether a feature of the best people, this gratitude and mindfulness of benefits. That's the end of the sutta. Uh, This sutta is telling us that we should be grateful to those people who have benefited us, uh, especially our parents our elders, our teachers, uh, monks who have taught us, etc. Uh, And we should know uh, that a person who is ungrateful, uh, according to the Buddha, is a mean person, uh, especially uh, people like our parents, whom we owe a lot. uh, And we can see this in the next sutta. The next sutta, 2.4.2, the Buddha said, Monks, one can never repay two persons, I declare. What two? Mother and father. Even if one should carry about his mother on one shoulder and his father on the other, and so doing should live a hundred years, attain a hundred years, and if he should support them, anointing them with unguents, that is fragrant oil or something, eh? kneading, bathing and rubbing their limbs, and they meanwhile should even void their excrements upon him. 
Even so, could he not repay his parents? Moreover, monks, if he should establish his parents in supreme authority, in the absolute rule over this mighty earth, abounding in the seven treasures, not even thus could he repay his parents. What is the cause of that? Monks, parents do much for their children. They bring them up, they nourish them, they introduce them to this world. Moreover, monks, whoso incites his unbelieving parents, settles and establishes them in the faith. Whoso incites his immoral parents, settles and establishes them in morality. Whoso incites his stingy parents, settles and establishes them in liberality. Whoso incites his foolish parents, settles and establishes them in wisdom. Such a one, just by so doing, does repay, does more than repay what is due to his parents. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha is saying that if we should take care of our parents for a hundred years, eh, taking good care of them, eh, bathing and massaging them, etc., carrying them about on your shoulder, eh, even for a hundred years, you still cannot pay back the uh, debt of the parents, eh, owed to your parents, eh, because when we are young, eh, if all of us uh, try to recall, we know on many occasions when we were young and helpless, eh, when we were sick, eh, many a times we could have passed away if not for the great care eh, that our parents uh, uh, showered on us, eh, especially our mother, uh, all of us. Eh, uh, yeah, we know eh, that the mother usually eh, has, uh, takes uh, more care of the children personally eh, uh, then the father. That's why in the Indian tradition, they always talk about Mata Pitu, mother first, mother, father. Whereas in the Chinese tradition, we always say father first and then mother. And uh, so, you see, uh, if we, even if we were to take good care of our parents until they died, uh, it's difficult to repay their kindness. So, you, you can think uh, of a person who is not filial, uh, to his parents, uh, somebody who does not take care of the parents, uh, uh, and uh, after the, the parent has passed away, uh, I've seen for myself uh, somebody uh, who was not very uh, filial uh, to the parent, and after the parent passed away, uh, the remorse uh, the, is very great you know, uh, on that person, uh, because uh, the feeling uh, that you have not done what you should have done to somebody whom you owe so much. It weighs down heavily on your conscience. Then the last part, the Buddha said, if we want to repay our parents, there are four ways where we can repay them and repay them fully and even more than what is due. One is, if they do not have faith in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, you bring them to listen to the teachings of the Buddha, or you lend them tapes to listen, etc., and so that they have faith in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Uh, then uh, you have one. There is one way you have repaid your parents. The second one, if they do not know how to keep the precepts, uh, they don't know about sila. You teach them to keep the five precepts. Uh, that's another way you repay them, uh, so that they are established in sila. The third way is if they are stingy, they don't know how to do dana offerings, eh? then you teach them to like to do charity, to be generous. Eh? That's the third way. The fourth one, if they do not have wisdom, and you teach them eh, the dhamma, or you get uh, them to listen to uh, cassettes, etc. of the Buddha's teachings so that they understand and then their wisdom grows. Eh? These are the four ways eh, that any one of them eh, or all of them eh, we can use eh, to pay our parents' kindness. Eh. Why are these four ways important? Because you bring the parents eh, into the right path, eh, into the right path by having any one of these four, uh, if they are well established in any one of these four things, uh, faith in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, uh, keeping the sila, precepts, third one, being generous, liking to do 
uh, dana uh, offerings. Uh, and the fourth one is having wisdom. Uh, then uh, at least uh, they will not fall into the woeful planes in the next life. Uh, and if they are well established, uh, especially like in wisdom, uh, they might never ever fall into the woeful planes again uh, and uh, slowly get out of samsara. Now, the next sutta is uh, 2.4.4. Now, the house father Anatta Pindika came to visit the exalted one and saluted him and sat down at one side. So seated, he said this to the exalted one, Pray, Lord, how many in the world are worthy of offerings and where should an offering be made? Then the Buddha answered, Two in the world, house father are worthy of offerings, the learner and the adept. These two are worthy of offerings in the world, and here an offering should be made. And that's the end of the sutta. Now, this is uh, one of the suttas uh, that we need to comment on, otherwise people uh, may have some wrong uh, bias uh, interpretation or extreme interpretations. Uh. The Buddha, Buddha is saying that two types of persons are worthy of offerings. And these two types uh, are Aryan persons. The first one is a learner. A learner is what is called a Seka. Seka. S-E-K-H-A. Seka means one who is training. And one who is training is a person who has attained the first path or the first fruit or the second path or the second fruit the third path or the third fruit, and the fourth uh, fourth path. These are the seven types of persons. And the adept uh, is the A-Seka, A-S-E-K-H-A, A-Seka. A-Seka is one who is no more learning. That means an Arahan. Arahan is a fourth fruit uh, person. Uh, and these are these areas are there are eight areas. It's not that there are four areas, you know. There are eight areas. Later on, uh, we can see some suttas, uh, which can prove uh, that um, you have eight persons actually, uh, not four. There are some teachings and uh, some later books, uh, like the I think the Abhidharma and com- commentaries, uh, which say that when a person attains the path, he immediately attains the fruit. Uh, but later I can uh, show you some suttas uh, where it is not quite so. Uh, you can have a person who is on the path and he can be on the path for many years before he attains the fruit. So here the Buddha is saying that these uh, Aryans are worthy of offering. And uh, it is partly because of a sutta like this uh, that there, there are some people, the um uh, Due to the uh, greed uh, for merit, uh, sometimes they only like to uh, make offerings uh, to monks uh, that they think are Aryans. And they think that other monks are not worthy of offerings. And uh, this is not the Buddha's teachings. uh. The Buddha has said uh, in some other sutta, I think in the Anguttara Nikaya, that if you make offerings to monks uh, with a selfish motive, uh, to get such and such merit, then it reduces your merit. That's one thing we have to know. Uh, The other thing is, uh, the Buddha has stated uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya 4.60 that it is the lay person's duty uh, to supply the Sangha with the four requisites. uh, uh, The four requisites that a monk needs uh, are the four essentials of Existence, lah. the first one is food, the second one is robes, lah. the third one is a uh, uh, place to stay, eh. and the fourth one is medicine lah, or medical care. Lah. And uh, the Buddha said it is uh, a lay person's duty eh, to supply monks with these four requisites. And... Uh, if lay persons don't uh, take care of uh, the Sangha, then who is the Sangha to turn to? Uh, they might as well disrobe and uh, earn their own salary eh, if uh, lay people don't support them. And 
Another thing is um, there's another sutta where the Buddha said, "In the future, I don't have the uh, number of the sutta offhand." The Buddha said, "In the future, there will be monks uh, who wear the yellow robe, and they might be corrupt. They might not keep the precepts, uh, and they might not practice the spiritual path, etc." Even then, the Buddha said, "If you make offerings to them." Still, it is meritorious. Why? Because if we make offerings to the sangha, then it helps to perpetuate the sangha. And uh, even if at a certain stage yeah, the sangha uh, do not practice well, later there is always a chance that you might get arhans again. Uh, just like in Sri Lanka, certain certain countries like Sri Lanka, there was a time when the monks were corrupt, uh, and so. Uh, Uh, some people were so disillusioned that uh, some monks uh, they went to Burma, they went to Thailand to reordain and come back and establish a new uh, uh, chapter, a new uh, sect of sangha. Like for example, the Siam Nikaya in Sri Lanka. It was started after a monk went over to Thailand, reordained with the Thai sangha, and came back. Uh, he wanted to change the sangha. So uh, it is. Important uh, for lay people to continue to support the sangha, so that uh, the sangha can continue. If it is cut off, uh, then it is forever cut off. Uh, and the Buddha said that it's always more meritorious uh, to offer to the sangha than a single monk. That's why uh, we notice uh, in the uh, Vinaya, the Buddha's mother. That means the lady who looked after him, lah, uh, as a mother, lah, is actually his foster mother, lah, because his real mother died uh, very soon after he was born. Eh? And the foster mother became a nun known as Mahapajapati. And uh, after she became a nun, eh, she decided to make a robe and offer it to the Buddha. So she came. And because of the love for the Buddha and the respect, eh, she personally offered this robe to the Buddha. And the Buddha, out of compassion for her, refused to accept. The Buddha said, "Please offer it to the Sangha, because the Buddha wanted her to have more merit." But because of her sort of some attachment to the Buddha, eh, the, the the love, eh, She didn't want to offer it to the sangha, even though the merit might be less. She wanted to give it to the Buddha. Second time, she came and offered it to the Buddha. Second time, the Buddha refused, asked her to give it to the sangha. Third time, she came and offered to the Buddha. Third time, the Buddha refused, asked her to give it to the sangha. Both also had the mutual love for each other. <laughs> one wanted to give it to her, to to him personally. The other one, out of love for her, also. Wanted her to have more merit, asked her to offer it to the sangha. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it is stated in the sutta that of all the material offerings that a person can give, the highest material offering uh, is to make a monastery, either to offer the land for a monastery or to help build a monastery. For the sangha, and the Buddha said, by uh, offering a monastery to the sangha, the uh, merit uh, is higher than feeding the Buddha and all the arahan disciples. Uh, all the arahan disciples together, uh, feeding them uh, is not so meritorious as offering a, a, a monastery uh, for the sangha to live. Why? Because by offering a place for the sangha to live. Uh, Then the sangha is perpetuated. It continues years and years and years. Now the other thing is, uh, lay people uh, uh, should not discriminate too much uh, between monks. Uh, the Buddha said in one sutta that uh, lay people should not be too attached to one particular monk. Uh, the details are, are, are given in that sutta. I will, there's no need to mention it here. And uh, why? Because it is very difficult for lay people uh, to distinguish between monks. And uh, in the suttas, we find uh, even an anagami like the lay person citta 
even though he's an anagami, uh, when he invites monks to his house, uh, he bows down to them. Uh, even though they are putujana or what, uh, even he's an anagami, he bows to the monks because he is bowing not to the particular monk, he is bowing to the sangha. Uh, the monks represent the sangha. Uh, uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya 4.4, the, pers- uh, the Buddha says that if you if you treat four persons badly, eh, you have wrong conduct towards four persons, eh, you create much demerit. One is to the Buddha. The second one is to his uh, disciples, that means his monk disciples. Eh. Third one is mother. The fourth one is father. 